This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. <laughs> Be a human who can admit he changed his mind. This is what happens to us as human beings. Life can suck and our world changes. We choose to change. Our situations change. I do not believe God changes. However, what we know of God and our relationship with God can and often does change as we face the pain of caregiving and whatever else piles on. A journal gives us knowledge of both ourselves and God. These can be influential and provide the foundation for future growth as we seek God. Valeria Talley's interviews Ken Hagler, the author of Life Sucks, Seek God, Five Soul Healing Habits to Connect You with God When Life Seems Out of Control. Ken Hagler is an author, pastor, writer, YouTube creator, and podcaster. He has been in ministry full-time since 1996, serving in various ministry areas. During his ministry, Ken has served churches in Kentucky, Missouri, Georgia, Idaho, and now Alaska. His hope and prayer is to encourage and guide people to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ and experience faith every day. Ken is the author of Life Sucks, See God, a book dealing with the issues of grief, suffering, and pain, and five spiritual practices to face difficulties. He is also co-author with his late wife, Heather, on a book of children's sermons called No Prep, No Prop. Ken is currently working on publishing his third book, Prayer, Simply Breathe, scheduled to come out later this summer. His education includes a BS degree from East Carolina University and a Master's in Divinity from Asbury Theological Seminary. He is certified as a premarital and marriage counselor through Prepare Enrich since 1998 and received certification in spiritual formation and spiritual direction from Garrett Evangelical Seminary in 2015. In Ken's free time, he enjoys spending time out in the beauty of creation in a variety of ways. Hiking, camping, fishing, hunting, and more. You'll also find him delving into more writing and reading and enjoying Star Wars on a regular basis. Meet Ken at KenHagler.com. Here's the interview with Ken Hagler. In your own words, who is Ken Hagler? Ken Hagler is a follower of Jesus. Uh, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a pastor. I'm a writer. I'm an author. I'm all those things. Uh, but I'm really just, pa if there's one thing, I'm passionate about life over and over again. It just comes back to living. So my first official question to you really is, I mean, after the most important one of who you are, is about God. What, where, and who is God to you, Ken? Wow, that's a deep question. But you asked a pastor that, so it's kind of hard <laughs> not to talk to a pastor and ask that question, who God is to me. Right. And for me, I, when I go back, you know, it's been a lifelong journey. Um, you know, this year for me, I, I reached that that mark of 50 years old. So I, I think I'm in a place of a lot of reflection. Most of my life has been a point of reflection. So, and, and God has been there. Uh, being from my tradition as a Wesleyan Methodist Christian, grace is the defining word for my journey with God. And John Wesley talked about it as a prevenient grace, or actually that's the word we give. His word was preventing grace because the word has changed meaning since the 1700s. But it's this idea of 
God is going before us and is always at work to bring us into relationship with the divine. Mm -hmm. And and I think that to me, when I think about God, it is a, for me, God is a God that all encompassing understanding of of what love is, but more uh, intently, it's that that love is wrapped up in this word, as you mentioned, grace, yeah. but it's, it's this grace that is always at work, always longing, always drawing us mm. to relationship with God. And God doesn't see any person as a waste. God is constantly hoping always drawing, always leading. And so for me in that relationship with God, it's no matter how bad it's gotten, no matter the difficulties I've faced, I've always sensed and I've always held to that belief. And and so I'm I'm kind of an eternal optimist because I think God (laughs) is an eternal optimist. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, regardless of what somebody's theology is uh, and how they look at the world or how they look at God, because you know, there's many different within Christianity. There's so many different theologies and understanding of God, yeah. whether you're, you know, believing in free will or in predestination. It's still to me, you can't escape God's grace always drawing us to that relationship. Where is God? What would you say? Where is God? Yeah. God is everywhere. Like I said, and, and that to me is, is part of, you know, proving your grace. God is always at work. So you can't mm-hmm. be any place God is not. Mm-hmm. You know, the light is always permeating everything. And I think when we look at our world, mm-hmm. you know, there's times that we can look at things and see like, you know, God's not there. Right. And right. I would stand in the midst of that and say, you know, there was the Bette Midler song where she's saying, God is watching us from a distance. And uh, that always disturbed me because for me, the most significant name for God is Emmanuel. And that's God is with us. So there's no place God is not. And to me, that's where a significant amount of my hope and my faith comes from. Yeah. And I love, love your answer because that brings us to that space of unconditional love. Right. Doesn't it? There's nothing that's really wrong because God's everywhere. It's the work of God. And that is really a challenge to really grasp with the mind if we are in the mind all the time and not in the heart. Absolutely. Right? Because it's tough to understand that one. And again, it's kind of one of those pieces that, um, you know, we look at it again. I'll go back to John Wesley. He talked about how scripture is our primary means by understanding God and the Christian faith but that it must be informed by our reason, our experience, and our tradition. So that you, you, can't, you can't just go all into your head. Right. There's got to be that life experience. So that's that heart piece of how we engage in the world right. and, and needs to be informed by, by coming back to God's revelations to us. And another thing that I uh, usually talk about here, it's that idea that there is just unconditional love. There's just God. Nothing else is really happening. Right. Which is, yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, that certainly is part of, you know, our understanding of theology uh, of understanding God, that study of God is when we, you know, when we try to talk about love and try to simply get into this emotional understanding and, and boil it down and say, well, it's just, you know, love is all there is. Well, that is who God is. Mm, (laughs) That that is the very nature of God. And to sit there and say, well, we can love somebody. Well, that's a form of that love, but that unconditional love, you're not going to have unconditional love. You can deny it, but you can't deny Mm. that's God. God Mm. is there. Uh, in the midst of that. Yes, what an important message. Yeah, we can deny it, but it still is. It's still unconditional love. It's still God. It cannot be denied unless we choose to, right, Ken? Yeah, and, and we can deny truth, but, you know, that's still, it's still there, uh, you know. And I wonder why this came to happen, this separation from the ultimate reality, as I call it, unconditional love of God. How did that happen? Why have we chosen our own reality, our own small world outside of God? 
Oh, wow. I think that's kind of a deep thing, but I think historically, I, I think we see it, it. It's happened throughout history. I think for us, though, it resonates, I think, in large part in the 20th century when we began to think that that our reason, uh, our ability to think, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and, and it's kind of a I don't know, it's dangerous to say it, but we, we had the idea of science would be the thing that would solve all of our problems. Yes. And right. and we know in the midst of COVID, yeah. it, mm. it hasn't. Uh, right. You know, right. we, we don't fully understand everything, but, you know, right. the wars, you know, World War One and then World War Two, you know, this idea that humanity could on our own you know, come to the solutions that the world would need and that our governments would solve these problems and these things would happen simply if we thought the right things, we had the correct science and everything was in place. This would solve this and we didn't need God anymore. Mm. And because we as human beings could do that. And and I, I find it, you know, amazing when we look at the scriptures, we go back into the Old Testament into Genesis, and we find the story of the Tower of Babel, where humanity was trying to make our way to heaven. And so all of humanity got together and said, hey, we're going to build this great big tower mm-hmm. uh, so that because we're the ones in charge. And we've been doing the same thing wow. for centuries, you know, right. that it doesn't work. And, yeah, right. um, but when you don't know history, um, you know, it repeats itself, doesn't it? So another question I have for you is about the meaning of losing the body, the meaning of death. What would that be from your perspective, Ken? Wow. I I was always struck by, I believe it was Tilhard de Chardin who said that we are not physical beings on a spiritual journey. We're spiritual beings on a physical journey. Yeah. And I, I think that that quote really sums up how God views us. And it's not that it's not that the physical world isn't something we are to maintain. Um, You know, as a Christian care of creation is something that God from the very beginning said, you know, I've created you and you are to care for this world. And, but it's to recognize that I think our true nature is spiritual and to, to lose sight of that is to deny a huge piece of who we are. One of my mentors, um, Fred Schmidt, just wrote an article about one of the struggles with COVID um, has been this ongoing thing with, again, within our understanding of reason that uh, the clergy and chaplains have been um, removed from the hospital so that we couldn't visit people, we couldn't provide pastoral care uh, in person to people who were suffering and in need, because the idea was that the physical is all that matters. And yet so many doctors, um, many that I know um, and have talked with and other studies have said that's that's a key part of the medical recovery and, you know, people's overall health. So, you know, we can't deny that. And yet we have. So for me, death is not the end. It's just part of the part of the journey. You know, our the death of the physical body is only one part of this. So not the private one to ask you the question about the purpose of life, but the purpose of your life. Have you found that? Do you believe in having a purpose as an individual? Oh, absolutely. You know, as an individual, I think that's all very unique. I recently was reflecting on that. There's a a book called Sacred Pathways that Gary Thomas talks about nine different unique elements of of who we are and how we relate to God. And so I think that's that's part of it. You know, Scripture tells us that that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and that we're all not the same. And to me, that's an important message that I feel like uh, here in these days for me, uh, a lot of people aren't hearing. And, and that is this uniqueness that is important for us to, to, to hold to, that God has made each and every one of us unique. And, and part of that journey for me is to realize, I think that's changing for each of us. If we're growing and that's what we're called to do, that in our tradition that, you know, if you are born again, if you confess faith in Jesus Christ, that, you know, suddenly for some people, that's the end all. Well, you've done that piece. 
So yeah. you're good. You're going to heaven. Yeah. And, and to me, that's a, that's a really stunted growth. I mean, it's like, okay, I planted the seed and it's in the ground. Mm-hmm. So, but, but if you watch the seed, it, it has to break through the, the barrier to, and then fight its way up through the soil to get to the light. Yeah. And, and that's part of, of who we are. We're always mm-hmm. growing. Uh, you know, we're always on that journey. So I, I think there's a constant learning, you know, for each and every one of us. So for me, that's a big part of, of my, my life is that I need to keep learning. And there's been hard times for me in this journey where I, I did feel, you know, stunted and, and I had, I stopped. And that was, that's, those are the darkest places when I wasn't growing. I think that's to me, however it happens to be that, that, that call to just keep living and exploring is, is a big part of my call. And I I think for me, the tagline that my mantra has become, uh, it's been different things at different points. And for me right now, it's faith for every day. And Mm -hmm. that my calling is to help people have faith in everyday life that that's where hope comes in and that that we're meant to have a faith that can withstand the storms. But that faith is also for the days like today here in Alaska where it's beautiful and sunny outside and we're going to get close to 60 degrees. You know, it's like, oh, man, this is awesome and beautiful out here. And that that's just a huge part of it. So I love what you said yeah, that's about learning, growing, because seems to me like we go through that process of growing and learning or we choose to go in order to help others so right. because we see the connection that everything's connected everything is god absolutely that's beautiful yeah, we, need, we need each other um there's just there's no way there's no way we get through this <laughs> we don't get through this place alive <laughs> in, in <laughs> one sense you know, and uh, and we need each other on this journey. And my last warm-up question for you, Ken, is freedom. What is the meaning of freedom to you? I think freedom is the movement of our lives. And that includes, again, what we've talked about, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. And it is to be able to move and act in any way that we see fit. And I think that's part of God's uh, going back to grace. Mm, It's that God gives us that freedom because God freely gives his grace and love to all. And and that means that, that we, we can act in ways that are terrible to other human beings. And just as we can do that, we can also act in ways that are loving, compassionate, and caring. And so it, it, it really is that, that ability to act out of all aspects of who we are for the good of all or for, for even for evil. The opposite, yeah. Uh, and everything is one. Uh, that is a very profound and important message to, to understand, not just intellectually, but with the heart. It goes back to yeah, grace, I love that word, and unconditional love. It really does. Right. So you wrote the book, Life Sucks, Seek God. Five right. soul healing habits to connect you with God when life seems out of control. So two initial questions. How did you become a writer and what was the main inspiration and intention of writing your book? Well, as a as a pastor, and I guess it even goes farther back than that. I took some classes when I was in college. I was a broadcasting communications major, and uh, so I took some journalism classes, did a little writing, did creative writing, went on to grad school, which, you know, when you go to grad school, there's a lot of writing. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> and, and, and then through the years, you know, as a pastor, I, I got to, uh, you know, I wrote, I write all of my sermons. And as I was doing that, I realized there was a lot of things that, that, you know, as a pastor, when we do that writing, we don't always get to say everything that we want in a sermon. And uh, way back, I started on MySpace and uh, wrote a little bit there. People may not even remember that one. Uh, But um, I then uh, got on blogger.com and uh, and started writing. I guess back in 2004 is when I started my blog. It was somewhere between uh, 2004, 2005. 
And uh, so that's really when I, I guess I started writing yeah. um, different thoughts and, and, and kind of working my way on it. And uh, as far as the book goes, I actually, this is a book that was not intended to be my first book. Um, I actually had written uh, another book <laughs> that, uh-huh. that uh, has not been published yet. Um, it's It's gone through one editor, and so I, I'm kind of making my way back to it. Um, but this book came about as I was, you know, going through the journey with my kids after my my first wife's passing, um, after she died of cancer, and my daughter actually challenged me with telling me that you know you you didn't share everything that you share with everybody else, and I mm-hmm. was like, wow, that you know, <laughs> that uh-huh. that was that was hard to hear. So from that, I looked at the journey that I was on as as I was getting to know other people in a, a particular Facebook group that were cancer um, caregivers, and we had been on this journey together, and, and it it became kind of the book that uh, that I didn't intend to write, but it was the one that just kind of overwhelmed me, and uh, and it, it came out of it came out of that that pain and suffering, right. uh, grief. So. Why did you choose to become a pastor, Ken? Wow, I, it's. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell people: don't ever pray the prayer to God that says, "Here, God, take my life and use it how you want." Right. Um, but but I prayed that prayer back when I was a junior in high school, <laughs> and God never let that go. And and I'm glad. I mean, it's it's you know even when I've tried to to kind of move other places and other directions. God just keeps opening the door. But uh, that's really where it came out of. It was, you know, I was a, I was in high school and, and I had come to faith in, in Jesus Christ and uh, was following Jesus. But, you know, I really didn't have a lot of direction and was really struggling with that. And, and I was at uh, Lake Junaluska Retreat Center in North Carolina as a teenager. And uh, I was out on the, the deck outside our room. And I just prayed the prayer. I said, God, here's my life. Take me and use me however you want. And, uh, and God just slowly again, and that, that provenient grace began to open the doors little by little first into youth ministry and then later into pastoral ministry. And even when I look back on it, so my degree in broadcasting with everything that's happened in COVID, you know, moving into online, yeah. uh, being on YouTube, and those things were things that I was pretty comfortable with, right. and uh, been able to try to provide some guidance to other pastors along the way, and experiment and try to be creative. So for me, it, it's it comes out of that relationship with Jesus Christ, um, trying to follow Jesus, and and He's led me in this particular journey, and it's not the only one. And you know, as a pastor. You know, there's so many different ways that people can follow after Jesus. But the the church affirmed that, you know, in my tradition, your your church, you get examined. Uh, in many ways, it's kind of like the process of, uh, of going before the bar exam. It's going before a dissertation. Uh, you know, we have to write in the Methodist church, we have to write and defend our theology and faith before people that don't even know us wow. and, and have to go on the interviews and, and those reputations for for where people have seen God at work. So, and, and that's where God is, has kept leading me is right back here into this place. I love this idea of surrender, just kind of um, letting go of this separation, the individual, the person, right? That wants to control everything right. and get to heaven with uh, what do you call like a building or something, build something to get there. Yeah, the, <laughs> the Tower of Babel. <laughs> the tower. Yeah. That's a yeah. funny story I never heard before. It is. <laughs> so talk to me for a moment about your own journey through this idea about life that it sucks. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, talk to me about that, Ken. Yeah, well, you know, it's one of those pieces that is, as I looked at it, it, it you know, the part of it in the back cover, I talk about the Valley of Suck. Um, you know, it was really a group of us that were, uh, it wasn't just widows, but we were caregivers of family members um, who were were at the time dying of cancer um, and, and are on this process of living with cancer, fighting it. But, you know, we're the caregivers. We were the ones that were primarily there day in and day out to to care for our loved ones. And so we needed support and we started talking about it, and and one day it occurred to me. There's the twenty third Psalm talks about 
the valley of the shadow of death. Yeah. And for us, as we were talking about it, I said, you know, the, the shadow of death is there, but it's not a death for us. I said, instead, mm-hmm. it really is a valley of suck. And that is that this, it's a place in our lives where hope and joy, mm-hmm. our dreams are being sucked out of us so that, you know, as much as we try to move forward, it's we keep getting sucked back into this valley and everybody resonated in in the group. We, we started talking about it and everybody was like, that's the term. That's exactly what it is. And so as I looked on it and I reflected on it throughout scripture, it's one of those things that first people, when they read the title, they go, I don't know that I like that title. Yeah. <laughs> right. But to me, it was also an important aspect that we needed to name it. And Scripture actually names it. When we go to the Bible, we look at the the oldest book in the Bible is believed to be the book of Job, which is all about a person who loses his, his whole family, his health, his wealth, and everything, you know, and, and he's suffering. And so it's all of, you know, life, his life sucked. And he actually, unfortunately, he had he had friends that came around him that didn't help. They weren't really encouragers either. Wow. And we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, which talks about this, you know, life is kind of this plodding along kind of journey. There's a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations, which is all about grief. Mm-hmm. And wow. so we, we get these stories and we get this wisdom literature from the Old Testament uh, on through where God and the people of God name it, that this is a hard thing that we're in. This life is not easy. And I think we live in a time where pastors and the people of faith struggle to name suffering. We struggle to deal with grief and name it for what it is because we have a group of people that now just want to live in a Pollyanna world and put on rose colored stained glass glasses and, and just say, everything is great. Everything is wonderful. God just wants us to be happy and love and it's rainbows and unicorns. And that's not the reality of life. That's the panacea. Mm -hmm. That that's this idea that, you know what, just what we, put on our social media. We just post the good stuff. Mm. You know, we don't want people to know that we're lonely and we're hurting and we're in pain and, and, right. and we're depressed. Right. And, you know, we're dealing with, you know, my child is, is acting out in, in destructive ways. And we, we don't want to talk about how I've lost my job and that I'm going in debt. And we don't want to talk about those things. We just want it all to be good and happy. Yeah. And there's a point of it. You can't get to that point of things being all good and happy until we name the reality that we're in. So mm-hmm. for me, yeah. it was so important in the first part of this book that I name the reality of suffering and pain and grief. And we need to come to grips with that. I love what you said, a very interesting insight. I'm not sure if you did it on purpose, but living with cancer or living with. So going back to the idea of living and not dying. So it's living, choosing. And in your book, you say something that caught my attention. You said, during the last days of my wife's life, I rarely left her bedside. It was always a choice, and I chose love. So it is about that choice, choosing to live with grace, so to go through whatever life brings us, but with grace, with love, and not the opposite, which is, uh, I I would call it fear and resistance to what is happening, which doesn't make things easier. It's quite the opposite. What is your message for those who are going through grief, Ken? I've never been through that myself, so I, I don't have one, but what would you tell anyone who is going through this deep suffering at this time? You're not alone. Right. It doesn't necessarily, it doesn't make you feel better to know that other people are suffering. Uh, there's a point, I think, that, you know, the idea that that misery loves company. I don't think that's the case, but it, it is the reality that no, there are there are those that are on the very similar path that you are on, and so you know our group of caregivers that we were on. There was a lot of of us who are widows or widowers, 
But there were others that were sons and daughters caring for a parent and some who were parents caring for children. You know, cancer is one of those those diseases. It, it doesn't look at us. Uh, you know, you can't you can't look at any one person and say, oh, that person is more likely to have cancer. Right. You, right. you know, you can't do that. I mean, I myself am a cancer survivor. I was yeah. a cancer survivor yeah. um, from 2000. And so for me, it was wow. So, um you know, at that time I was, you know, I was, a, I was a dad already. And my wife at the time was pregnant with our daughter when I discovered I had cancer. So, you know, it, it was important for, for me and it is for me to, to tell in this is the message that you are not alone. And, uh, you know, you're for me, I'm a widower. I, I you know, <laughs> I talk about unicorns and, uh, <laughs> There's the whole TV show called The Unicorn that's about that. You know, a dad who's a widower, you know, we're, you know, I'm not, I would not even turn 50 yet. And, and I lost my wife and that doesn't usually happen in our world or it's, and so you're not alone in the midst of the pain and suffering grief. You're alone if you want to be, mm, um, right. I guess you're, you know, if you want to be alone, you're going to be alone, but if if you're in the midst of it and you're just feeling that you're alone, you don't have to be. I love that. We talk a lot about choice, but the more I think about it, it seems like it's God choosing anyway, um, because God's doing everything. So it's behind everything. We think we are choosing, but it actually is that grace that's washing over it's just, yeah, for some reason, that's the mystery too. I'm not sure why it happens to some people and not to everyone. Well, the book of Deuteronomy says the secret things belong to God and we don't understand. And, you know, for me, I, I love the, the Celtics had a great image um, of thin spaces. And, and that is those time between times or, or a nexus is another word that's kind of popular in our day and age. And so the, those thin spaces are the threshold of a door where you're in between. I'm in or I'm out of the room mm -hmm. uh, for the mm -hmm. for the longest time. My 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 <laughs> old cat, Tigger, he would walk right up to a door and he would jump because he and my my wife at the time, we were like going, why is he doing that? And it occurred to us, it's a thin space and animals understand that presence. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a there's that moment. Uh, midnight is that time. It's is it morning or is it night? Right. And and when you're on that journey mm -hmm. with somebody who's dying, you're in a thin space. And that's one thing that I realized it it was, you know, my wife and I were going to part company and she was in a thin space. And as we were, we were having the, she rallied at one point. It, it always takes me back to that moment. Yeah, um, right. But, uh, you know, in, in that time, I had talked to a friend who was a hospice nurse and I said, how do I know what's going on? She, she doesn't seem, she's on this pain medication. And she said, look at the furrow in her brow. And, um, my wife was really scared. Um, and as we were talking, she said, I don't know what to do. I really don't want to put on the medicine because then it's, I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to be asleep and I won't know anymore. I said, you need to take it because you're in pain. Yeah. Yeah. And she said, how do you know I'm in pain? I don't feel mm. pain. I said, because I'm looking right at the furrow in your brow. Mm. And when you look at somebody, when you're in pain, you, you can see it, particularly somebody that has a migraine or a headache, their, right. their brow gets really furrowed and her head and her, her forehead was so furrowed. And so I said, honey, you need to, you need to do this. And so that was, that was the last conversation that we got to have. And that's, you know, I, I really didn't leave her side and, and particularly during nighttime was the time that I was usually always, I was always there. I stayed with her at night because I knew those were, again, that's midnight. Those are those thin spaces. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that was the time that I got to be present as she was in between it makes me think about sacred spaces or sacred moments, right? Yeah. That word comes to mind. And as a pastor, I've been there before. I've been there, you know, as a pastor, I get privileged many times to be with families in those, those sacred spaces of watching a loved one depart and being present in those moments. Um, and it is very sacred. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't think we, we don't do death in our world well. 
So we're almost at the end and we didn't talk about the five soul healing habits. <laughs> so I <laughs> love <laughs> that's in your book. Would you like to mention some of them? I know the listeners might be curious to know. Sure, sure. <laughs> Um, well, I, you know, the thing about that, that's really where I'm kind of going next with my writing is to kind of start to, to write some books, unpacking those, those five habits that I, I talk about. Um, you know, and it really starts with the idea that we take five, that you set aside some time in your day to focus on the divine, to focus on your soul as it, you know, we're so busy that we fill our life with lesser things. Yeah. And those things that we that matter the most, we don't give any time to. So true. You know, we'll give time, <laughs> we'll give time to to waste on you know YouTube videos and cat videos and <laughs> and you know Netflix and Hulu, um, <laughs> and then say at the, oh, I just don't have time for God. Right. Really, you don't? Right. Uh, how right. does that work? So it's you know really starts with you know taking time. I also talk about devotional reading. I, I call it cheating. Yeah. Um, you know, that if you're not, if you're not a biblical scholar, uh, if you haven't gone to seminary, you know, sometimes people think, well, I haven't had enough Bible study. I don't know. There's wonderful books to help guide you in the process. I'm a huge supporter of uh, the Upper Room Ministries out of Nashville, as well as the Daily Bread. Both of these are are, are, are ministries that provide devotionals for people. You can get them online as well. And to have something as a guide in reading scripture and a prayer, I realize it's not to get more knowledge mm. that this, this is a cheat about knowing God. And I think that's important. Mm. You know, just reading scripture is an, an important part for me. I always tell people uh, I get the privilege many times to give children Bibles um, that are old enough when they reach third or fourth grade, depending on the church. And I always tell them, you know, great books of the Bible to start with. Start with the Gospel of Mark, which gives you it's the shortest of the Gospels, and it gives you who Jesus is in, in just 16 chapters. So if you were just read a chapter a day, that just takes 16 days. Um, or the book of Proverbs, which is full of great wisdom. Uh, those, are, those are important. But also yeah. just to talk to God, that idea of prayer. Um, that's actually the book that I'm working on now is a, a book called Prayer, uh, Simply Breathe. And one of the things that I've been doing, even before my wife passed away, I started doing breath prayers and it's very simple uh, prayers. And so the next book I'm doing is on breath prayer, primarily on how to pray these very simple prayers um, that are based on uh, Jesus's prayer that he teaches in the parable of the tax collector, Lord God, or actually it goes, it goes, uh, the Orthodox church, it is who prays it regularly. And that is Jesus Christ, son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, and the prayer can just be as simple as praying to God, one word, mercy, and crying out to God from where our hearts cry is. So, you know, that, that really kind of narrows it down. Um, you know, just some of those, um, and there's so many other spiritual practices from our tradition, but those are the ones that I, I really kind of dig down to, um, right there in the book. Those are the ones that really helped me along the path. I love the breath prayer. That's an interesting practice because breath is the, the foundation, isn't it? So basic. Well, and in the Hebrew, the word for spirit, mm -hmm. ruach, mm -hmm. is also the word for prayer. Oh. Um, so, um, and and that breath. So, breath and spirit go together in in the Hebrew tradition. You're talking about the same thing. So, um, you know, understanding that when we're breathing, you know, it's that connection to the spirit. Right. And and taking advantage of that and looking at it, that that's part of part of the tradition. You said something about um, knowing God. So I'm wondering, when did that happen for you, Ken, this movement from believing in God to knowing God? Wow. So <laughs> I'm glad that you bring that up. So there's a there's a, a great story that I love, and it's about... It's about two kids. They were they were out playing. It was a winter day and it snowed and everything was frozen over and they went out playing and they they were running along in the woods where they loved to go and they came across their mm. their favorite creek. And one of the the kids walked up to the creek where it was frozen and he said, oh, "I wonder if it's frozen enough to cross." 
And his buddy said, I don't know. So the kid took a stick and he started tapping. He said, well, I tapped it. It looks like it's frozen. The buddy said, okay. And, and then he took his foot and he tapped his foot. And he said, oh, it feels like it's frozen. So his friend said, why don't you just go out on there? I said, oh, I can't do that. And his friend said, so you believe, but you don't have faith. And I think that right there is the point where we get to where a lot of people believe, right. but they don't have faith. And for me, it was stepping out and saying, I got to, you got to put both feet out on the ice. And that means you got to follow Jesus where Jesus leads. And it's all going to come back to that because as we understand in the Christian faith, Jesus is a representation of God to us. So when we look at Jesus and how Jesus lives, that's how God intends us to live. Well, that means we've got to follow. And that's not easy. Right. And I'll never forget when I was in college and I was in the theater and in, it was in uh, uh, dance theater and, and I was sitting, I was running the lights and I got a call for a prayer call. And I was like, prayer call? Uh, we're in theater. What is this? So, so I went down and to join with all of the dancers and mm -hmm. the team that, that gathered. I guess there was about 30 of us. It was a huge dance group we had. And, mm -hmm. and everybody was praying. And it came around. We were doing it in a circle. And uh, everybody was taking turns. It got to me. And I prayed. And uh, a couple other people prayed. And after it was over, I suddenly got surrounded and I will, and people were asking me questions and it never occurred to me. I just prayed the way that I always did when I talked with God. Right. And one of the questions that one of the dancers said to me, how do you pray like that? You pray like you know God. Mm, right. And I said, you know what? I do. I do know God. And after that, I, I regularly would be <laughs> on set, building sets and, and working in the theater. And I would have dancers and people come up and want to talk to me about God all the time. And yeah. uh, to me, it, it's as easy as breathing. That's grace itself, knowing faith. And I call it surrender. And it seems yeah. like life yeah, it's a great word. Right, keeps giving us this opportunity to surrender. But then if it doesn't happen then we still have one more chance after we lose the body before, right before, mm -hmm. to surrender to that. Well, and it's it's that grace, yeah. you know, going back yeah. to where we were at the beginning. This yeah. is provenient grace. God is at yeah. work yeah. all yeah. the time. Yeah. There's not going to be one chance. Right. You'll get many. So I have a few more questions for you, the ending questions. Before I ask them, would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book? No, I, I, I think I'm pretty good. Um, you've asked a lot of great questions. And, uh, you know, in particular, you know, as far as the book goes, I, I guess there's there's plenty of stuff I could read. But, you know, there wasn't anything that just kind of jumped out that said, you know, I really just want to share this one thing. You know, it really is. It's not a long book. So, yeah. you know, it, it's it's easy to read. I'll have the link also on your podcast profile, your website. I'll ask you in a moment. Two more questions to end the interview. If you knew you would lose the body soon, would you make any change or do anything in a different way? No. It's been the best that I can. And I've made, gosh, I've made so many mistakes in this life. But if I didn't make those mistakes, I couldn't have learned from them. I watched both of my adult children They've made so many mistakes too, but I know that they're learning. And it's hard as a parent to watch your kids make those mistakes. Yeah. But, you know, some of those are the best ones that you can learn from. So, no, yeah, beautiful I, I don't answer. think I'd do anything different. And my last question is, what are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? God never gives up. Jesus is always the example to look to. And the Holy Spirit is available to strengthen and guide us every step of the way. Thank you so much, Ken, again, for your beautiful, graceful presence, the work you do, the compassion, generosity. Thank you. Well, thank you for, for the, the opportunity. I'm so really thankful for it. Oh, so. I love doing this, so you don't have to thank me. <laughs> it's, oh. it's like my sacred space <laughs> to be here. <laughs> yeah. I understand. I understand that. Right. Absolutely. And oh. before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? 
Absolutely. The best place to find me is at kenhagler.com. And if you are on social media, if you'll look up Jedi Pastor Ken, you'll find me there. I'm a, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. That really <laughs> didn't come out of that. But, uh, but yeah, Jedi Pastor Ken is my moniker. Um, I, I believe that, that, you know, there's so much joy and so many ways that, that our, the world connects together, that uh, faith is a fun thing. Um, getting mm-hmm. to know God is amazing. So uh, I, love I, I love to make those connections. Faith is a fun thing, and it is. Yeah, I agree. That's beautifully said. I never heard that way before. <laughs> I don't think I've ever said it that way before. Wow. Yeah, and it is. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much again, Ken, and we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening. To learn more about Ken Hagler and his work, please visit KenHagler.com. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.